Okay, again, thank you for for attending here. Um, I have way more slides than I probably have time to present, so I'm probably going to go through pretty quickly. Again, if you have questions, just post them in the chat, and I'll try to get to them as we go. So the point of dewatering, or not the point, but with dewatering, you have to, you're going to be sending water somewhere other than where it is. And uh, that means you're going to be discharging water one way or another, either to groundwater or surface water. Since we have attendees from at least four different states, uh, and I'm presenting from Washington, and my experience is Washington, um, I just want to say check with your own regulatory folks to verify whether you can discharge one way or another. I might say one thing that works in Washington. Uh, that is not allowed in your state or your just jurisdiction. So the disclaimer is please check with your regulator. Um, also, if everybody could mute, oh, we're getting some noise in the background here. I don't think it's me. So for example, uh, the Washington NPDES permit has benchmarks for turbidity, uh, zero to 25, 26 to 249 and 250 with descriptions of what each of those requires. And then Port of Seattle, by contract, we just set it at zero to 25. So contractors have to meet 25 or less or less on NTUs. So it really depends on who you're working for. Oops. OK. Um, all right, so these are a number of disposal options. Uh, after I put this together, I realized this is pretty much in order of uh, expense. So the cheapest being prevention on up to offsite treatment and disposal. And I'll talk about each of these. So prevention is pretty much the easiest and cheapest thing uh, for anything that you do for as far as water quality, uh, stormwater, erosion control, keeping water out of your work area is going to give you the best bang for the buck. The less water you get in your work area, the less water you're going to have to dewater or deal with one way or another. So any kind of berms or, or you know, BMPs that you can use to send water from offsite your project into a catch basin or divert it around. Uh, it's just less water you're going to have to deal with. Excuse me while I admit a couple other folks. Uh, another example of that work area to the left, replacing asphalt, non-work area to the right, um, water on the right doesn't have to be dealt with. Another example, a uh, utility connection for a project that's going on to the right here. Uh, I can't remember if this is sewer or, San or uh, storm, but they've used asphalt berms to divert water from the road surface to the left keep it out of their project area, divert it to the curb line and into a catch basin. So it's all water they don't have to deal with. It's not going in the excavation. They don't have to dewater it. Anything that does end up um, within their work area, within the burned perimeter, ends up draining to the right corner here where the cone is. There's a little, uh, I don't know, one, two inch pump there. And they just pump it back into a hole they dug back in, in the site. Same for any water that they might have to pull out of the excavation. It's pumped back into uh, an area in the project. Next thing is infiltration. And this is something uh, the Port of Seattle has started doing fairly recently, last year or two. Um, and uh, it's a really effective thing if you can do it. Now, this is a picture of somebody that's preparing to test soil surface for infiltration. It's not something that we've done. It's something if you want to be precise on how much water you can put in the ground on your project, then you're going to want to do some kind of infiltration, infiltration tests. It's not something that, that we've done. Uh, when you infiltrate, you want to infiltrate water that's as clean as possible with as little sediment in it as possible. So under, understood that you know, you're not necessarily going to want to treat water first. Uh, sometimes you have to, but the less sediment in the water, the better. And the reason is you see this um, sediment on the bottom of the jar, that's what's settled down. And that's what's gonna plug up the uh, soil uh, and, and slow down your infiltration. So the less you, the less soil, the better for infiltration. This uh, is a series of pictures taken from a very large 
container terminal, all paved container terminal project. Um, lots of water to deal with. The water was draining into somebody else's storm system. So it was a, high, a highly controlled situation. Contractor figured out if we can get the water into the ground, uh, it's less we have to deal with. So they started plugging catch basins and uh, tore up asphalt near the catch basins, put in rocks so they could drive over it and then let water infiltrate. Another example of that is uh, grinding asphalt in preparation for doing uh, underground utilities. They left the grindings in place, blocked the catch basin, the water drains into the subgrade. On an emergency basis, an infiltration on this project was installed and it's just a trench. It was cut, cutting out 12 inches of asphalt down to subgrade and uh, letting it fill up. So again, this, no infiltration tests were done on this. Um, so because it was quick and you know had, had to be done quickly, could have been could have functioned even better with some infiltration tests, but uh, for the purpose, it worked great. Now, with that, because sediment going into the trench is slowly plugging up the infiltration, then every once in a while, uh, you need to go back with a bucket, a tooth, a toothed bucket to scrape the surface and open up the pore space again so you can get infiltration. Uh, same idea with utility trenches. This wasn't purposely constructed for infiltration, but serves a dual purpose. And when you're uh, putting in utilities, uh, it's often the case that you'll be done in one area. The trench will stay open, but you'll be done in one area as you're working the trench line. So potentially, and I've seen this done, you could pump from one part of the trench, dewater one part of the trench back into a finished part of the trench uh, to get rid of your water. So another thing to think about. The next best thing is to just manage your site water. And that could mean moving water around, uh, as in this case, moving from uh, dirty water from one area in the project where it's becoming risky, uh, risk for overflow and, and uh, hauling it over to another area uh, with lower risk. With all of these, with all of these uh, methods related to disposing of water, uh, if you're pumping into a ditch or you're pumping somewhere on your project, just make sure you understand where the water is going to go. Uh, this is an example of a partially crushed culvert that was buried in the grass. Uh, you couldn't even see it until the weed whacker came out and cleared the grass away. So if you're discharging water that um, you're trying to keep on site and it turns out there's a culvert in there that's leaving the site, that's not gonna be a good thing. So, so just know what is happening on your site at all times. So with that, um, general dewatering on a project is gonna involve pumps, storage, and dispersal of some type or another. So in this case, manhole was plugged um, and water was collected from this newly hydroceded area. And when the water is coming off clean enough, then uh, the plugs will be pulled, tanks will be pulled, uh, and, and uh, just leave it to the grass to do the treatment necessary. This is, I've seen this done several times, uh, just loading water into a water truck and spraying it on vegetation. Again, knowing where the catch basins and storm pipes are going, so water's not leaving or going places you don't want it to. You could also use uh, dewatering water, assuming it's clean. Uh, it, can, it can have tur uh, turbidity in it, but you don't want to have high pH or you don't want to have any chemicals in it, of course. So relatively clean water, uh, pump it and water your hydro seed. Another example, although we did use fresh water in, in this situation, you could use uh, uh, dewatering water. A special note on this, if you are gonna use this, uh, this type of system, get uh, adjustable fire nozzles and install on your water truck. You get a much better spray pattern we found. You can also dewater, use uh, dewatering water for dust control. You can design a dewatering system into your project. Uh, this is a um, warehouse building that was built a number of years ago, and um, it had to overwinter 
the, the finished product was completed the next spring. So all bare soil was covered, uh, soil stockpile, and then the surrounding area was, uh, was covered with gravel while water directed to a low spot and then pumped to grass nearby, pumped through a several hundred foot long perforated pipe and spread out into the grass. Now with this system, because of how it was designed and, and constructed, the water did come off with some small amount of tur turbidity, some small amount of sediment, but very, very low, uh, very small amount. So it was it just dispersed in the grass and never showed up anywhere in a storm system. Um, using ponds, temporary pond, or permanent ponds for temporary construction stormwater uh, containment. And then in this case, slowly pumping out into the grassy area around the, the pond. Um, note that they're pumping onto plywood to keep from scouring, and they're moving the plywood around to keep from killing the grass. So this, this uh, works out to be a really nice system. Moving water around within a work area. So the area to the back of the project, they're gonna be pulling the concrete forms off soon, um, but essentially the work is done for now, but they're still gonna be working here at the bottom of the picture where they've got the pump set up. So they're moving water out of the way to another part of the project. Use your site if you have low areas, bermed off, naturally bermed off areas, or in this case, a security, um, there's security fence in a concrete, uh, poured concrete uh, security berm, and a contractor pumped water over to this low area to deal with it later. Uh, I don't remember how they dealt with it later, but this is definitely an option using your site. In this case, I believe this was a uh, de-icer, a pocket of de-icer that was discovered during construction. And it was gonna take time for probably characterization and lining up somebody to, to haul it off site for disposal. So a contractor dug out a temporary pit, lined it with plastic and um, put the de-icer in here for later disposal to keep from holding up the work. So not highly recommended, but it is it was a good emergency measure at the time. And then just constructing temporary ponds as needed and if possible on your site to take care of if you're getting uh, especially large amount of rain in, in uh, fall season or winter or something. Uh, this can provide you a nice little buffer for managing water. Pumping water around your project. So in this case, it's clean water coming in, uh, from upstream in, the, in a grassy ditch. And they wanna keep it out of the work area, which you can see here in the background. So they're pumping around, pumping the water into a geotextile bag, which then drains through grass to a catch basin in the in a ditch line. Sanitary sewer is always an option. Um, that can be used, but check with your local sewerage agency in uh, King County, Washington. They have a process, the King County Metro system uh, have, has a process for construction dewatering. Um, it is pretty limited in the volume they'll take and the condition of the water that they'll take. So, but it, but it has been, we have used it. I've seen it used many times. Um, it can be a, a good backup. I think it's something that, you know, if you think you might need it, get the permit process. For King County, it's a permit process. Uh, get that worked out ahead of time so that you can go right into, uh, right into doing the work. And then um, on-site treatment is another possibility. And that's, this is a uh, 40, 40 year old me, I think. So again, mainly for, uh, for treatment of sediment and water uh, during construction, uh, on-site treatment is a good, good option for you. Now, there are two basic ways to do this. One is passive, passive chemical treatment. And I'll just mention this is not allowed in the state of Washington. Um, it is allowed in many other states, and I don't know about Alaska, Idaho, or Oregon. Um, but uh, definitely Washington, you cannot do this, but I thought I'd mention it just in case you can do it in your state. 
the two main treatment chemicals used are chitosan acetate um, and polyacrylamide. And basically it's putting the chemical, in this case, in geotextile bags and placing it in the, uh, the stream flow, not stream, in the water flow. So you're pumping out a, a dirty water from an exca excavation, for example, and you're pumping it across or over these, um, these bags with chemical and uh, it's treating the water. Same idea with the polyacrylamide. Uh, Flocklog is one of the companies that does this. So these are formed blocks of polyacrylamide. Um, but again, don't, don't use these in Washington. And then there's active treatment, which is, which is allowed in Washington. And I think probably most states, if not all states. And uh, active treatment is essentially a, an enhanced sand filtration system either using chemicals or electricity. So filtration in itself is not really an effective method for uh, reducing turbidity, in the, meaning the really fine sediment particles. Um, it's, it's not the best way to go. So if you add um, electricity, without going into any detail here, but if you add electricity to the uh, water stream, you're um, you're adding uh, ions or you're changing the, uh, your ionic charge, which is allowing sediment particles to coagulate and then flocculate and drop out. So these are the sand filters on the left and then the control system in the box on the trailer. So this is a little science experiment that I did once with nine volt battery with, uh, with aluminum plates. And you can see what it did over about an hour. So it definitely works. Same idea with chemicals. Uh, Chitosan enhanced sand filtration is one of the main methods for treating. And uh, so it's adding chitosan acetate to a treatment train with uh, many controls, uh, computer controlled, lots of monitoring and such. So very effective systems. And then lastly, the most expensive is, um, is hauling offsite for, for treatment. So this is useful for small amounts of water. Certainly wouldn't want to have to do this with hundreds of thousands of gallons. Uh, doesn't wouldn't make economic sense. So this could be 20 plus cents a gallon to do. But for small amounts or processed water like tire wash water, um, this, this can be a good option. OK, um, that's, that's the main portion. I'm going to add a few more things. And I just got a notice from Zoom that I've only got a few more minutes on this. I've got the free Zoom, so it cuts off 40 minutes. So I don't know why actually it should be longer, but okay. So a few other things related to dewatering, uh, plugs. Dewatering assumes you're probably gonna have to put a plug somewhere to contain water. And this is from my experience that air plugs, unless they're brand new, uh, they leak. And um, so in contract specs that I wrote for the Port of Seattle, I wrote that if you're going to use an air plug, you can use it for one day. That's it, because they they don't get maintained. People don't check them every day, um, and they fail frequently. So, just my personal opinion: uh, air plugs for no more than one day. Mechanical plugs are good if you're going to use them for a few days, and if it's if you need to plug for any longer than that, then concrete and brick. So, a grouted plug in a storm pipe, and I think we generally say uh, the plug should be one and a half times as long as the diameter of the pipe. Another concept is to absolutely keep your surfaces clean as much as possible so that if you do have to dewater, you're dewatering cleaner water, hopefully. Uh, the cleaner, the better. Gives you a lot more options. So sweeping or hand sweeping, vacuum sweeping and such. Another thing to consider is excavations um, themselves. This is a good and bad example. If the water is clean, you're getting clean groundwater in and you don't have your excavator bucket down there stirring it up, uh, potentially you can pump it into the curb line into a catch basin. Of course, you, you wanna test it and make sure that it is clean. But um, so that's the, that's the good side. Uh, again, check with your regulatory agencies to make sure they're okay with this. Now, even if people are okay with this, this is a terrible visual for somebody driving by to see this, even the water, if the water's clean. So I would not recommend this very highly, but 
um, it is a possibility. Dewatering wells. Uh, one thing to note on dewatering wells is when you set any kind of dewatering well, the initial production of the well is going to be dirty. It's going to be turbid. So you want to have a you want to figure out well, have some tanks available or something so that that initial flush would go in the tanks for settling or infiltration or some other disposal method. Once the water clears up, which usually doesn't take very long, then it could go uh, to ground. It can go back to groundwater somewhere else. It can go to surface water, uh, whatever. So in this case, small wells, and they're just pumping into a perforated pipe on a rock slope. And then in a larger system like the same thing, um, it's going to be dirty. In a larger system like this, you might get uh, several tens of thousands of gallons of production water that's too turbid to discharge immediately, but once it clears up, it's clean enough to discharge from my experience. Again, uh, check with your regulators to make sure they're okay with this. If you are doing anything with concrete, uh, cast, cast in place or um, precast vaults with concrete, the water that sits in them is going to have elevated pH. So on a precast, the it might elevate to nine or nine and a half pH. Um, in a cast in place, it could easily be 10 to 11 pH for some period of time. And um, just need to be aware of that. And before you can discharge that, it needs to be treated. It's uh, in the state of Washington, and I imagine this is, this is the same elsewhere, high pH water cannot be put into the ground, into groundwater. So it would have to treat, be treated with uh, some kind of mild acid, you know, like CO2 um, or citric acid, something like that to bring the pH down within the uh, typical range, which is six and a half to eight and a half. Um, another thing to keep in mind, this is for any sheen that may appear on your project from drips and leaks and stuff like that. If you're dewatering water with a sheen, make sure to dewater into a, a weir tank. So in this case, it's the portion to the right of the tank and everything that's floatable will stay behind this, um, the weir and water will go under and then back over. So you, you contain any uh, floatable materials in this one area so that you can manage it. Also watch your discharge rate. If you are pumping clean groundwater, say to a receiving water, or a small creek or something like that. Make sure you're pumping at a rate that doesn't overwhelm or scour the creek. Um, so I think 10%, no more than 10% above the base flow of the creek you're discharging to is pretty standard. So keep that in mind. By the way, I think this is Lake Powell discharge. And then I'm gonna close with contaminated sites. Um, if you're working on a contaminated site and you have a small amount of water to deal with, then it might make economic sense to hire a service to come out and suck it up, uh, profile it and treat it and discharge it through their system rather than to set up a full-on treatment system. If you have a large amount of water to treat, to deal with, with chemicals, in this case, it was PCBs, dioxins, furans, and a bunch of other stuff, um, then you do wanna set up some kind of uh, on-site treatment system, which was done on this one. Um, and that in this case, it was a Kytosan enhanced sand filtration system with granular activated carbon polishing at the end to take care of everything. So keep that in mind. Um, it does take planning. So if you do, do plan on working on a contaminated site, get the engineers involved early and often 